Our next speaker is Louis Granados, and he's the director of Humanist Press. He's also the author of one of my favorite books, uh, Damn Good Company, which tells 20 shocking and often humorous stories of some forgotten heroes of humanism throughout history. Not all atheists, uh, but all refreshingly more open-minded than the prevailing God experts of their time. It's a profile Profiles encouraged for secularism. I've been raving about this book since I read it on a rainy camping trip. It was so good that I was happy for rain. It gave me an excuse to get back in the tent and read more of this book. Buy the book. Uh, history is written by the victors, and the stories of these secular heroes have been forgotten. I thought I was pretty educated. I did not know these stories. The opportunity to come here today and talk to you about uh, my favorite subject, uh, which is my book, uh, Damn Good Company. It is basically a profiles in courage for humanists. It's a story of 20 men and women who had the courage to stand up to the God industry of their day and say, no, I'm not going to do what you say. And then in order to uh, sort of spice things up a little bit, uh, not make it too sappy, I, uh, as you can see, I appeared each one of these heroes against a villain, who are sometimes even, even more interesting. Um, the story that I want to share with you today, just, just one of the chapters, is about two men who lived their early lives uh, in almost identical paths, uh, but wound up uh, at really opposite ends of the pole, actually at war with each other, uh, because of their views on government and religion. Catches up. Uh, the man, uh, the hero of our tale, is a fellow named Manuel Azania. Now, before I get into it, other than people who've read the book, how many people here are sort of generally familiar with Manuel Azania? Okay, another no hitter. That's what I usually get. Um, Manuel Azania was born in 1880, just outside Madrid. Uh, he was educated as a Catholic uh, in the famous monastery of El Escorial, uh, but he hated it there because the atmosphere was so terribly anti-intellectual. He wound up uh, going into journalism and becoming one of Spain's most famous and prominent and notorious uh, anti-clerical writers. He didn't hate Catholics though, in fact he married one, but he found that religion was in his words, an obstacle to responsible citizenship. Pure faith, he wrote, is unsociable. It is not useful in the Republic whose sovereignty neither strengthens nor defends. Benito Mussolini, he's the bad guy, in case you're wondering, <laughs> was born in Italy just three years after his onion. His mother sent him off to a Catholic boarding school in order to keep him away from the influence of his father who was uh, known for not being very religious. But that didn't work. And when he began his own career as an author, uh, as a young man, he was just as anti-religious as the son he was. In one of his works, he dismissed priests as black microbes who are as fatal to mankind as tuberculosis germs. When will the day of vengeance come, he asked, when the people free themselves from tyranny and from religion? that immoral disease of the mind. Azania's Spain was dominated by the Catholic Church, and as a result of that, it was so backwards that by 1931, everything just fell apart. The economy, uh, civil government, everything else. The king finally abdicated, and Spain reluctantly, finally joined its neighbors in deciding to allow the people of Spain to decide for themselves how they wanted to be governed. And what they decided at those very first elections was to end the tyranny of the Catholic Church. Azania jumped into politics, and a coalition that he led won those first elections and swept into power. Azania became the first freely elected prime minister, and even more importantly, one of the main drafters of a new constitution for the world's newest republic. Now, that constitution was an extraordinary document. It not only refused to say that Catholicism was the official religion of Spain, but it went just the opposite and said that in Spain, 
all varieties of belief are going to be tolerated. Absolutely infuriated the church. Control over marriage, cemeteries, and education was transferred from control of the church to control of the civil government. Government payments to priests were suspended. If you want to make somebody mad, just cut off his salary. That will work. <laughs> Women, for the first time, were given full rights of citizenship, including the right to divorce. As Anya famously put it, Spain has ceased to be Catholic. <clears throat> now, this was in a country where just five years earlier, a woman had been thrown in jail for committing the crime of saying publicly that she thought the Virgin Mary had more children after she had Jesus. So those days are over, but uh, at least for a while. Benito Mussolini jumped into politics also, but in a very different way. Using the excuse of anarchy, which his own folks created in the streets, his fascist party led a march on Rome that frightened the king into putting Mussolini in charge. Now, Despite all those anti-clerical writings that I gave you a little flavor of, this coup was fully backed by the Catholic Church. Why would they do that? Are they crazy? No, the Catholic Church is not crazy. Basically, they were making a bet. You see, the whole idea of fascism is it, it, based on the Latin word fascist, which is a, a bundle of sticks. You know, you can break each stick individually, but you can't break the bundle together. The idea was that every segment of society ought to work together in a, a lockstep unity. And the church was making a bet that it would be that Mussolini would find it easier to unite the church in to his little bundle than to try to squeeze it out. And they guessed right. One of Mussolini's first acts was to reinstall a crucifix in every classroom and every courtroom. In 1926, secret negotiations began over a series of agreements that, among other things, established Catholicism as Italy's official religion, just the opposite of the direction Spain was going. The deal put Catholic indoctrination back into the public schools and said that priests who commit crimes can be tried only by the church, not by the state. The church was given total control over marriage. Criticism of the Catholic church was made a criminal offense. Then there was what's called the financial settlement, in which the taxpayers of Italy forked over to the church the equivalent of over $1 billion in today's money. You know what they used that money for? That was the seed money for the Vatican Bank. That's where it came from. The Pope gloated that we have given back God to Italy and Italy to God. Now, a dictatorship works best when the public loves the dictator. The Catholic Church did everything in its considerable power around the world to try to promote that. The Pope called Mussolini the man sent by Providence. Here in America, Cardinal O'Connell called him a genius in the field of government given to Italy by God. Mussolini returned the favor, declaring that, I wish to see religion everywhere in the country. Let us teach the children their catechism, no matter how young they may be. It's pretty far removed from calling priests black microbes like tuberculosis germs. <laughs> Meanwhile, back in Spain, the church wasn't taking Zani's victory lying down. Only two weeks after he was elected, the Catholic primate was already condemning what he called the triumph of the enemies of Jesus Christ. The Catholic politician, Gil Robles, after he returned from that giant Nazi rally at Nuremberg that you've seen the, the, the films of, proclaimed that we must reconquer Spain. We must found a new state, purge the fatherland of Judaizing Freemasons. What does it matter if we have to shed blood? When the time comes, either Parliament submits or we will eliminate it. Azania did not submit, and in 1936, after they lost yet another election, the Catholic side finally gave up on the ballot box and rallied to the side of General Francisco Franco a chief of staff of the army, who launched a military uh, re rebellion against the elected government. Now, most of the army quickly joined Franco's revolt, but there was a problem. There was a bad problem. The problem was most of the army wasn't in Spain. It was across the water in Spanish Morocco. And, as luck would have it, 
most of the Navy remained loyal to the government. So how are you going to get there from here? The solution was an airlift provided by our friend Mussolini, who intervened on Franco's side from the very start, keeping a promise he had made to conspirators as early as 1934. Hitler soon jumped in as well, and uh, uh, Pablo Picasso uh, portrayed the work of the Luftwaffe in his famous work, Guernica. Ultimately, some 100,000 Italian and German troops, many of them conscripts, wound up fighting for the Catholics in Spain. With almost all of the army on his side, Franco could have swept into power right away, but speed was not his intent. He didn't want a coup. He wanted a permanent revolution in which the forces of humanism would be crippled beyond recovery. He wrote once to a friendly diplomat, I will occupy Spain town by town, village by village. Nothing will make me abandon this gradual program. It will bring me less glory, but greater internal peace. Dear Ambassador, I can assure you that I am not interested in territory, but in inhabitants. I cannot shorten the war by even one day. Now the church, as you may have guessed, hardly approved of all this. I love this picture. Um, you can see it. Franco's the one under the canopy, and the bishop has to walk outside. The Cardinal of Toledo called the war a clash of civilization with barbarism, of the inferno against Christ. The Pope himself denounced the Republic's truly satanic hatred of God. When the southern village of Rotsian was taken by the rebels two weeks into the revolt, <coughs> the parish priest made a speech from the balcony of the town hall. You all no doubt believe that because I am a priest, I have come with words of forgiveness and repentance. Not at all. War against them until the last trace has been eliminated. Over the next three months, 60 villagers were shot. That was not enough to satisfy the priest who complained to the authorities that they were being too lenient. One of Franco's colleagues, General Mola, spoke of the important role that terror had to play in the campaign. It is necessary to spread terror. We have to create the impression of mastery, eliminating without scruples or hesitation all who do not think as we do. General Keipo Dayano spread his own brand of terror on his infamous radio broadcasts. Our brave legionaries have shown the red cowards what it means to be a man, and incidentally, the wives of the reds, too. These communist and anarchist women, after all, have made themselves fair game by their doctrine of free love. And now they've at least made the acquaintance of real men, kicking their legs about and struggling won't save them. As wars go, the Spanish Civil War ranks very high on the barbarism scale. There were terrible atrocities committed on both sides, lots of them. But that doesn't mean that both sides were equally to blame. Most national leaders throughout history, when they're confronted by this kind of revolt, assume dictatorial powers. Even Abraham Lincoln did that. But Azania never gave it a second thought. His insistence on not destroying that wonderful constitution he had just written in order to save it resulted in anarchy when, right after the war began, almost the entire army, almost the entire police force deserted, leaving vigilantes, hardcore communists basically, to do their worst. None of this was condoned in any way as by Azania. He did everything that he could to try to maintain order. Maintain order. Partly because he knew it was the right thing to do, and partly for the very selfish reason that he knew he had to have some support from the Western democracies if he was going to pull through this thing. Every time a priest was shot, every time a church was burned, the hope for that support went down. By contrast, the Catholic rebels had a conscious policy from the top down of using the war to exterminate humanists from Spain. Now, we all know that winners write history books, and the Catholics who won the war never tire of mourning the fact that there were 55,000 civilians killed by government supporters, including 7,000 members of the clergy. That's true, and there's no way to defend that. 
But since the death of Franklin, historians have been able to start to do some counting on the other side. And their best estimates now put the number of civilian victims of the Catholic rebels more in the 180,000 range. And that's just during the war. Immediately after the war ended, Mussolini's sidekick, Count Ciano, reported back home that there were literally hundreds of executions being carried out in the streets every day. The most recent compilation is that there were 150,000 executions of Azania supporters after the end of the war. Another 400,000, including Azania himself, were driven into exile. Now, unfortunately for them, you know, think about it for a second. You're in Spain, you gotta get out, where are you gonna go? Well, you're gonna go to France. That's a brilliant idea. Except that one year later, France was overrun by the Nazis also. Azania uh, died uh, while hiding away from the Gestapo in France. Uh, he died of illness, but quite literally, he died of a broken heart. So, the question is, how did the government that clearly had majority support of the people of the country managed to lose a civil war? And the answer is that it was outgunned. Franco's rebels received massive aid from Hitler and Mussolini. But the Western countries, including this one, wouldn't even sell weapons to the democratically elected government of Spain, largely because of the political influence of the Catholic Church. Throughout the world, the Catholic clergy and press rallied to Mussolini's Spanish cause. One prominent English Catholic wrote to Franco, might not be a great man as the world judges, but he is certainly something a thousand times more important. A supremely good man, possibly a saint. Here in the United States, Franco's Catholic champion was Father Charles Coffin the powerful radio priest in the 30s. In 1936, Franklin Roosevelt had no stomach for a fight with Father Coffin or any other risk to his hold on the Catholic vote. Roosevelt announced what he called a moral embargo on arms sales to both sides, which essentially elevated these military rebels to the same moral plane as a democratically elected government. The great New Dealer, Harold Ickes, wrote in his diary, Roosevelt said frankly that to raise the embargo would mean the loss of every Catholic vote next fall. This proves up to the hill what so many people have been saying, namely, that the Catholic minorities in Great Britain and America have been dictating the international policy with respect to Spain. Franklin Roosevelt later admitted to his cabinet that the embargo had been a bad idea, telling his Spanish ambassador that we have made a mistake. You've been right all along. But by well, then it was too late. Spain became a close ally of the Nazis during World War II. Spanish troops fought alongside the Nazis on the Eastern Front. Spanish bases were, were supplied for the uses of German submarines to prey on Allied shipping. Uh, when, when Franco established control over Spain, um, the, the church was re elevated to 16th century glory. Um, uh, the church was given control of marriage, education, uh, cemeteries. Uh, Spain had the strictest censorship in Europe, even stricter than that of the Soviet Union. Uh, my, my favorite example is that in Spain, the King James Bible was censored because it's too Protestant. Now, Mussolini today is remembered as a sort of a pompous buffoon which I think is a, a light sentence for a hypocrite that big, who's personally responsible for seven figures worth of deaths. But the greater tragedy is that Manuel Azaria is not remembered at all. Now, forget his, his personal courage. Uh, he did spend time in jail as a political prisoner. His vision of the tolerant society that Spain finally did become uh, after Franco's death. His leadership of one of the very few truly nonviolent democratic revolutions in the whole history of our planet. Isn't the guy who wrote, liberty does not make men happy, it makes them men. Isn't he worth remembering 
for that alone. So that is a uh, very abbreviated version of, of one of my chapters. Uh, I, I want to leave a little bit of time if you have any questions about any of them. There are 19 more. I certainly enjoyed learning and writing about these guys. And if you have a chance to get the book, uh, which is uh, available from Humanist Press, you can look that up. Uh, I hope you'll enjoy reading about them just as much. Thank you. Well, the good way of looking at it is the books have already sold out. Oh, okay. uh, it was a logistic issue that I wasn't able to bring very many. Okay. Um, but yeah, it, it's all all the, the normal places, Amazon, right. whatever. Um, I got mine as an ebook, and so you know you can have it in two seconds if you want. Yeah, ebook or or printed book from <coughs> any of the normal sources. I'm Ann Slowly from Bethel Park. For 26 years, I've run an agency uh, earning nothing on the crimes against children by clergy mm -hmm. and investigating uh, documents and its usage. Um, I was told that in 1925, Mussolini told the Vatican, and you, maybe you know this, uh, or if it's right or wrong, Mussolini told the Vatican, if you support my fascist regime, and um, publicly, you know, align yourself with that, that I'll grant you non-profit status to the Roman Catholic Church, which still stands today. Well, absolutely. Uh, they, it was 26, actually. Uh, that was the, the, the latter entreaties that we talked about. Uh, there was even a couple of years ago, there was a comedian in Italy who made some sort of joke about the Pope. I didn't forget what it was because it wasn't all that funny. But she was prosecuted. Because it is a crime in Italy today, because of those latter entreaties that, that still exist on the books, it is a crime uh, to ridicule the Catholic Church. Um, I don't think she ever did any time in jail, but, but there was a, a prosecution, which I'm sure she liked because it made her much more popular. Time for an atheist conference in Italy. Any questions for the police? I'd like to ask a question. As I understand it, uh, contraception and abortion are legal in Italy, uh, despite the back in, back in once. How do you explain something like that? Or can you? Um, there's a very strong secular uh, movement in Italy. Um, in fact, that's why Mussolini had to overturn as many things as he did overturn, uh, because Italy was one of the stronger secular countries in Europe uh, throughout the whole latter part of the 19th century. Uh, one of the reasons why the, the, the church was so against the Italian government was because the Italian government, when it united Italy in 1870, had taken over all the lands that, that, that the, the Pope used to run. And um, so that tension is still there today. Uh, the, the current uh, governing party um, uh, uh, particularly the, uh, his name, I'm, uh, I don't know the name, um, uh, I, I forget his name, but the guy who's been Prime Minister for much of the past 10 years. Yes, Rolls Stoney, the guy who owns AC Milan, um, has done a lot to try to flip things the other way and give them greater tax exemptions and benefits. Uh, but there's an important uh, secular theme in Italy, and always has been. Ever since Garibaldi was very yeah, Garibaldi. Hello. I'm not sure if the question's for you or for some of the other speakers, but it all fits together. I spent 10 days in Turkey and became aware, for instance, that all the imams are paid by the state yes. in Turkey. And they even build the mosques, I think. Um, and that they're told what to say on their Friday sermons dictated from government. And then in Israel, uh, you can't have a secular marriage. They have to go to other nations and have a secular marriage. I say all that to say, I wonder when we say separation of church and state, 
should we add synagogue and mosque? And I know that will make not, not a real good looking bumper sticker, but we should admit the others and not give, I don't think, that, uh, just one side all the, I just wondered if you were any other speakers have any thoughts about that. Well, in Turkey, one of my chapters is, is about editor, who in some ways I think is the most impressive one of anybody that, that I wrote about. The changes that he was able to accomplish in Turkey are unbelievable. He even changed the alphabet. Okay, that's a hard thing to do. Um, but he said, we're, we're, we're writing in this Arabic script and it doesn't fit the language, so here we're, we're going to have a real alphabet. And the one that they presented him uh, had a Q in it. He, he said, hey, we don't need a Q. What do you need a Q for? Because there's no Q in the Turkish alphabet. Um, Turkey, unfortunately, uh, under the current guy, Erdogan, is uh, going way back the other way. Um, it's becoming a much more uh, Islamicized than, than it was under editor. Uh, there are lots of secularist uh, journalists in Turkish prisons today, uh, and it's, a, it's an extremely bad situation. And yes, in Israel, um, the, um, I don't know if you call it a church, but the Jewish authorities have total control over marriage, and many Israelis have to fly over to Cyprus uh, in order to get, get married in, in the way they, they want to be married. 